Hi everyone, and welcome to this milestone episode of the 8-Bit Computer Series. Today we're going to be completing the data path loop, a complete half of our processor. Before we do though, I'll explain what the data path actually is. Up to this point, we've looked at various key components of our processor. The ALU, registers, memory, and the multiplexes in between. However, I've not really explained where all this is going, because we needed to know what the components were before we can really piece them together. Every processor, conceptually, has two halves, the data path and the control path. The data path is what does the actual processing work. We load some data into registers, perform some operations like addition and subtraction, and get a new result and put it back into the registers. We can also write values from registers into memory. The data path also keeps track of where we are in the list of instructions that make up our program. The data path forms a loop. The registers are at the bottom and store temporary data. The memory and ALU sit side by side as the middle of our loop, taking values from the registers and producing new results. And then the multiplexers at the top allow us to choose which result to send back to the registers at the bottom. The data path has lots of signals hanging out the side. These are the control signals that allow us to control what the data path does on each clock cycle. In this processor, we'll have three phases for the data path to go through for each instruction of the program. In the first phase, we'll read the current instruction for memory. This is known as fetching the instruction. In the second phase, we'll increment the program counter so that it points to the next instruction of the program. And in the third phase, we'll actually execute the current instruction, meaning we'll look at the value we fetched from memory and set up the control signals to the data path to match what's needed for that instruction. To achieve all this, let's look at the complete data path in module sim. In the middle, we see the ALU we designed, with the multiplexers on the inputs to select values from the registers below. On the left, we have the memory and logic units. The logic unit has some additional components that we'll look at in a moment. In the upper right corner, we have several multiplexers. These are being used as AND gates. Again, we'll look at exactly how these work in a moment. Their outputs control whether to read from memory or not, and whether to write a value into memory, AREG or BREG. In the bottom right corner, we can see the program counter register and the operand register. The program counter has a dedicated adder unit for incrementing the program counter in the second phase of execution. We can also select to write a value from the top of the data path into the program counter. This will allow us to do something called branch instructions, sometimes known as jump instructions. These allow us to move to different places in our program rather than only ever going sequentially through the instructions. For example, we might use a conditional branch to move to a different part of the code based on whether a door is open or closed, where the door state is an input to our processor. Our operand register is a special register. When we load an instruction from memory in the first phase, we will split it into two halves, a high nibble and a low nibble. A nibble is four bits, half of a byte. The low nibble will be the operand of the instruction, a small number we can use within the data path. This will go into the low bits of the operand register. A special prefix instruction will enable us to set the high four bits of the operand register to the instruction's operand. The high nibble of the instruction will be the opcode, the operation code. This will tell us which instruction it is. With four bits, that will give us 16 possible instructions. The additional modules around the logic unit are being used to control when we write to the program counter register. The program counter is updated whenever we are in the second phase of execution or we are in the third phase of execution and one of the following is true. 
Either we are executing an unconditional branch instruction, or we are executing a conditional branch instruction and the condition is true. Using all this, we can now manually control the data path. Let's simulate phase one of the execution by hand. First, we'll put a value into the memory so that we can see when we've loaded it. Next, we'll clear our registers and clear all of the control signals. Then we'll set up the control signals for our first phase of execution. We want to load from memory at the program counter address and write the memory output into the opcode and operand registers. So we make sure our memory address is coming from the program counter. And our opcode and operand registers are enabled to write. Now we're ready to step the clock and see what happens. Normally, four clicks would get us all the way through one clock cycle, but for just the first cycle here, we need six clicks. This is just because of the way we've wired up the clock. We can now see the opcode has been correctly loaded, as well as the operand. For the second phase of our data path, We'll disable the opcode and operand write signals, as those are now done. Our second phase is to increment the program counter. To do this, we'll use the dedicated adder for the program counter register. We set the phase two signal, which will enable the PC register write. We'll also make sure the PC input is set to the adder unit and not the feedback from the data path. OK, good. We're ready to step the clock through phase two. Four clicks this time, and we can now see our program counter has been incremented. We'll disable the phase two signal now. For the third phase, we need to decide which instruction we're going to simulate. For now, we'll ignore the opcode we loaded and try a few basic instructions. Let's start with a simple load constant. This copies the operand register into the A or B registers. We'll do both, starting with the A register. For this example, I'm going to repeat phase three several times in a row. In the final design, our processor won't skip phases one and two. This is just to demonstrate how we can control the data path. Now let's see an example of a simple subtraction. We'll do a reg minus b reg and put the result back into a reg.
Lastly, let's see a branch if zero instruction. This instruction will branch to the program counter plus the operand value only if the value in the A register is zero. We can make a prediction though as to what will happen next. As a result of the subtraction that we just did, A register is zero. So in this case, the condition for the branch is true and the branch will be taken. In other words, the program counter will be updated. In general, the value in A register would be the result of some more detailed calculation and is often a condition in a loop. What we can see is that our control signals set up everything in the data path, so the values are computed. All stepping the clock does is save the result into the selected register. We've now seen the complete data path. While I've not shown every possible combination of control signals, we'll be looking in the final episode at which ones we really need. This will be based on what instructions our processor will have. That's it for this episode. Tune into the live stream tonight to see me build and test the complete data path in Minecraft and ask any questions you have in the live stream comments.